but going off of you know those those famous characters in the in the film like Doc Hudson how how did you guys approach like a Paul Newman or a George Carlin how did how did you pull such heavy you know not all not only auto enthusiasts, but George Carlin, Jay Leno. You got a, a yeah. ton of cameos. Michael in Schumacher at Michael the Schumacher. end. Michael Schumacher. Yeah. Michael Schumacher at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, Disney does have a lot of great connections for for character voices, and we have a casting department that will go to people and, and put those things out to them. Hey, so welcome back to another episode of In the Driver's Seat with ABS. We have Jay Ward in the house. Very He's special virtual. guest. He's right in front of us. <laughs> but you are the creative director of franchise at Pixar. So thank you yes. very much for coming to join us and uh, always being a big supporter of the Audrain and the Audrain Museum and our Concours and everything else. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I've been to the Audrain since the very beginning. I feel very fortunate to have gone to the first one and seen how it's grown tremendously in a short amount of time. I've known Jay since the first event, actually before the first event, and he's been nothing but kind to everyone here. And uh, it wasn't a surprise when he agreed to do the podcast, but it's great having you on to chat with us. Oh, I think I appreciate it. I know I know I'm not the Jay no, Leno, gonna... Jay. You got another Jay, but uh, but thanks for having me. Well, great to have you. We've uh, we've got a fun day slated with us, and as we mentioned uh, to you, we start every episode off with uh, what's in the news. And I guess I'll start because we're on it. Um, sort of related, but not directly related. Recently, you might have seen Jay that Nike is starting to sue a number of different companies who are slightly infringing on their designs. Might not be an exact copy, or um, it might not look exactly like what they're doing, but they're going after a number of companies. And I wanted to kind of bring up to the group, is this something you think we'll see more in the car world? Because there are a lot of things like LED headlights and general shapes of cars that seem very similar across the board. And also, Jay, is this something that you've come across in uh, the Pixar world? Well, I mean, you know, we were part of the Walt Disney Company, right? So they, they acquired Pixar in 2006. We've remained whole and separate from Disney, but they are our parent company. And Disney definitely knows about copyright mm -hmm. uh, and protecting that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's been times when there's things that have come too close and will, you know, tell somebody, hey, that's, you know, that's actually a copyright infringement. There's a lot of stuff out there that is an imitation, but it's kind of not really a threat. It's kind of more people riding on coattails and that's probably OK. Sure. Um, yeah. The Nike Swish is interesting, right? Because that is such an iconic shape that identifies the brand uh, where I think, you know, the car companies have a chance to go after each other as if a logo feels like another brand's logo mm -hmm. or yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. do we think this is something that is going to happen or are we surprised that it hasn't or maybe it's just creative um designers who are doing this in a very specific way with each of their cars well i think you see it more so with the designation of a model like for example the 90 the 901 turning into the 911 mm -hmm. or the model e for the tesla being the model 3 so um, as far as the design aspect go, I'm sure there's going to always be this and that. But I think it, when it comes to like very specific things that people have high, high visibility on like model designations. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of opens up a, a lot of conversations. I mean, you look at like all of the cars that are made in China that are direct copies of a lot of. I mean, I remember there was an example with the BMW X5 or something yeah. like that made in china and it looked exactly like an x5 and bmw tried to sue that company and it actually didn't work in bmw's favor so i think yeah. it kind of opens up a lot of different conversations that way i was at the detroit auto show the year they brought that car to detroit oh wow and really? it was super yeah it was super bizarre this is a long time ago and it might have been cheery or it could have been you know uh, one one of these more at that time totally unknown chinese brands and they brought this x5 looking thing that was almost a direct copy the badge on the back was like seven letters long you know the designator of the of the model the swan one s dash ceo hbj six four seven four wide 
And they were so clueless to how the U.S. car market worked. They were giving out tea sets as gifts for people who came to the booth. I was like, <laughs> walking away with this weird tea set, like, th thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the problem was then and probably still is now is that Chinese copyright law is different than the yes, U.S. And so it's, it's, it's tough to, to enforce that stuff. I think it's gotten better, but... You know, Chinese have actually started making some decent cars. And, of course, now you've got U.S. studios like Buick that have studios over there. So yeah. it's definitely changed in the last decade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. What have um, you got today, Sean? You know, I, I wanted to talk to Jay about this during the Concord, but we were so busy and I just never got had an opportunity to. But, um, you know, for those who are tuning in who, who aren't, uh, aware you were very involved in the cars franchise and still are of course um specifically with sally carrera uh, and among many other things um and this summer at pebble beach rm sold a uh one-off sally carrera if you will it had very you know individualistic um uh custom piece you know uh, Porsche aspects to the car that were uh, direct influence from Sally Carrera. They, you know, of course, uh, advertise it with Sally Carrera, and the car ended up hammering at three point six million dollars. So I was just curious what your thought was on that car when you. I'm sure you saw it and you know, what it made you. You know, and then of course the hammer price. What, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm. I more than saw it. It was actually Porsche that reached out to me to make the project happen. Oh, there you go. So. Yeah, so Angus Fitton, who is the VP of marketing for Porsche Cars in North America, reached out to me and he said, hey, you know, when the pandemic started, we auctioned off the last 991 ever built, which happened to be a Speedster. Mm -hmm. um, it raised 500000 for COVID charities. Porsche matched it and we gave a million dollars to COVID. And we want to do something new this year. This was at the beginning of, uh, of last year. Uh, we want to do a new charity. We want to do a female focused charity. We're thinking Girls Inc., and Sally Carrera, we built a life-size Carrera, Sally Carrera for the movie based on a 996 that we modified and it's in the Porsche Museum now. He said, that car is one of the most popular cars in our museum. Could we build a, a modern 992 Sally Carrera? And I said, you know, here's the problem. I don't want you guys putting eyes and mouth on a brand new car and some person buying that car and driving it around. To me, that's not quite right. That's taking our intellectual property, going back to your Ben to your Nike comment and driving a Sally Carrera right. 992 variant around. And then what happens when they hit somebody or, mm -hmm. you know, get pulled over for drunk driving? Not good. So I said, what you could do is make a Sally edition. And we ended up calling it the Sally Special. And I pulled in Bob Polly, who designed the original Sally character. So Bob Polly and I represented Pixar, and we worked directly with Porsche in Germany on the car, on designing it from wow. start to finish. Uh, we worked with the Zonderwunsch program, which is the Special Wishes program. Yep. And basically, they said, you guys have carte blanche. You can do whatever you want with this car. So we started the highest variant of the Carrera range, which is a GTS. Mm -hmm. I spec no sunroof and a manual transmission, which is kind of considered driver's, holy driver's yep. spec. And then we just went from there. We said, it's got to have those turbo twist style wheels, like an homage to those. Mm -hmm. So we did a modern variant. And you know, on a 992, you've got a 20 and a 21 inch wheel, but we made a one off set of turbo twist wheels. We matched the Sally blue paint, which was a very, very, very hard paint to, to match precisely. It's a, it's a metallic blue that changes color in the light. Um, and then one thing that I thought was really smart was as we looked at the 992, the modern Porsches have a lot of black plastic and, and black body panels. Yep. And we had each one of those individual components painted body color, and it just kind of helped them fade and go away. And you started to read the whole shape of the car instead of seeing black breaking up all these shapes. Um, for the inside, we went with this houndstooth pepita pattern, but we added the blue from the exterior color. Bob Polly drew a little Sally Carrera character on the dash that said, you know, 001 of 001, Sally Special. We had light up door sills. Um, we did a Kachow mode button on the steering wheel. Yeah, um, we did a ton. Yeah, Kachow mode. And so all this work added up and we're like, okay, we're really excited about it. But at the end of the day, it's it's a very special GTS, but it's just a it's just a GTS. It's not a GT3 Touring. You know, it's not that, right? So with the options we ticked, we got it up to probably around 400,000. Wow. So we thought, okay, if it doubles that, that's 800 grand and, and, and that's fantastic. So that's what, that's what was in my head was that we would raise somewhere between um, six and 900,000. And we were all guessing around that. 
Angus and the Porsche team decided to bring Bonnie Hunt in for the auction. She was the original oh, wow. voice yeah, of Sally really. Carrera. She, yeah, she was in Jerry Maguire. She was in um, Green Mile. Fantastic actor. And she's just amazing. She got up there and did this speech about how it was going to benefit Girls Inc. And then at that point, we added Ukrainian refugees to the charity. So it was benefiting yep. really two very important groups. And people were like really getting emotional about it. So when RM started it, it went to a million dollars in 17 seconds. <laughs> I was like, I was just, my mind was, couldn't even fathom what that car was doing up there. And it went to a million, million and a half. And then it stopped at about 1.7 million. And the guy from RM walked over to me and he goes, Hey, um, I got a guy on the phone. He really wants this car. I think I can, I can get him up a little bit more. What would you be happy with? I'm like, I was happy, you know, a yeah, while ago. I'll tell you what, we're, we're, yeah, I was happy a, yeah. a million. So, so, you know, we're at one seven. If you can get him, if we can hammer it 2 million, I, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be thrilled. So he said, let me see what I can do. And before he could walk away and turn his back on me, somebody in the back of the room already hit 2 million and it kept going up again. Two, wow. one, two, two, mm. two, three, two, four, two, five. Then it was just two guys, one in the room who happened to be sitting by my wife, which was, she was a couple aisles over from me because it was so packed. And then one person on the phone and these two went back and forth all the way to 3.5. And then the guy in the room got off at three, five and the guy on the phone got it at 3.6. And I mean, we just, had no idea it was going to do that. It sold for more money than a new Porsche has ever sold for in the history mm. of Porsche. They've never sold a new car for more money than That's that. Incredible. Not even close. Well, it went to a good yeah. home too. The owner has a 959 yeah. and some other stuff I've seen. So it's great guy. Super nice guy. We met him when we handed off the car to him. We gave it to him. We met him at Porsche car, North American Atlanta and gave him the car and did a track day. And I got oh, to drive awesome. the Sally car and he followed in the 992 and it was amazing. Very cool. And he loves, loves Porsches. And his kids grew up watching cars and they love Sally Carrera as the perfect. character. And I'm like, perfect, yeah. perfect. Yeah. I felt huge regret because I bumped into Jay right in front of the car and I didn't ask him to get a photo in front of the freaking car. <laughs> yeah, we, we oh, when you were I was so yeah. mad. I didn't even think about it. That is a true story. Yeah. <laughs> After we left the building, you were like, oh, I'm so I'm dumb. So Why didn't pissed. I do that? <laughs> <laughs> you think about all the moments you wish you would have photographed. There's, yeah. there's a lot of those for me too. Yeah, we'll have Google lenses one day. We'll just like tap the lens. It's fine. <laughs> It totally. was great to see the car at RM, though. I mean, you and I walked in a couple yeah. times, and we got a really good look at it, and it's a beautiful car. I mean, you guys did a fantastic job, yeah. and, and the fact that it went to a good home and it was for a good cause at such a high well, price is and, and w amazing. We, we've got this upcoming theme on the podcast that we try not to mention Porsche too much because it's it all we talk about. Because we all talk Porsche. <laughs> but it's the, I understand. It's these understand. details that they hone in on for yep. projects like this and even engaging in projects like this from the first place that really make that company special. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And because of yeah. that hammer price, you know, I think you're going to see more, um, you know more projects like that obviously cars is such a special place and mm -hmm. you know my generation when cars came out i was 16 so um you know i remember seeing it in theaters and just it was it, as, as a kid growing up loving cars it's one of those generational movies that or you know that every generation is going to experience it for the first time and it's always going to be and cars are something that we all connect and all love mm -hmm. and all you know, it's it's kind of like what you know when they when what they say about Dark Side of the Moon. You know, it's been on the Billboard 200 for almost a thousand weeks, essentially mm. since the album came out. Because there's always a, a teenager experiencing the album for the first time, right? It's kind of like Cars. You know, uh, for me at least, you know, I, I from the moment my first memories, I always enjoyed you know anything mechanized and. When car, you know, when cars came out, I vividly remember, you know, hearing about it for the first time, and it's just an amazing thing that um, is going to be generational. So, I guess I, my my question to that is: uh, Do you ever do you ever think about that? Like, this is a film that is connected with so many people, um, and will continue to connect with so many people for the rest of time. I mean, it's it's one of those movies everyone knows about. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was talking to one of our colleagues who we work with, and she doesn't, she, you know, she doesn't really know anything about Cars, but she goes, "Cars is literally my favorite Pixar movie, <laughs> my favorite movie." <laughs> so it's 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 incredible the, the the you know the connections it has, and then for yeah, us, it, you know, of course, oh, that's a nine nine uh, nine nine six Carrera, or we can we can pull the little connections that you guys threw in there. Yeah, we, we a lot of connections with it. So, you know, to, to answer your question, we had no idea. When, when, so I, I started at Pixar on Monsters, Inc. That's the first movie I worked mm -hmm. on. 
um, and I was a PA in the art department, and that's a production assistant. It's an entry level position in the art department on Monsters Inc. So that was a long time ago. Um, you know, Pixar wasn't really a household name yet. Mm-hmm. You know, we get people applying, oh, I just want to work at Pixar. I want to work there my whole life. But that wasn't the case. You know, when I started there 20 some odd years ago, it was really you knew about Toy Story, mm-hmm. maybe, and Bugs Life had just come out. So we were still kind of making ourselves a household name. Um, and I was on Monsters for, I don't know, three, three years. And somebody said, hey, you know, I know you're a car guy because I drove an old car to work. I had a 49 Lincoln Cosmopolitan oh, cool. Coupe that was chopped with a DeSoto grill in it and a rockabilly kid. And he said, hey, I know you're into cars. He said, I want to show you this flat file full of art. We got this idea about this world of living cars. And uh, this might go into production. I go, oh, my gosh. Yeah, if that <laughs> happens, I'd love to work on it. And lo and behold, I think it was 2000. Uh, about about it, less than a year before Monsters came out, we started in pre-production on cars. I was one of the first people pulled onto it. Oh, wow. And the director, John Laster, was a car guy, but not at my level of geekiness. Mm-hmm. And he realized pretty quickly that I could sort of help him from a car consultant standpoint. So I'd say, ah, oh, you know, that's the wrong bolt pattern for a Hudson Hornet. You know, and yeah. actually that, this car is, you know, um, Fiat 500 has transverse leaf suspension, so they're really bouncy. And he's like, whoa. And so it really, he loved having that authenticity. Pixar is very big on getting the details right so i was able to go with them on all the detroit research trips and do all this stuff and really delve in i taught an auto 101 class to all the new employees that were working on cars that didn't know about cars um so yeah it it turned out to be this love for me um and when the movie came out which was the summer of 2006 um it was it came out and like all movies they come out they do well you have toys you have games then they just sort of fade off and you go on to the next movie cars did the opposite cars actually started kind of small and then started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it actually had this following that happened that we didn't expect and it's like everything related to cars just kept growing in popularity that's so incredible well you mentioned the detroit research trip and in kind of doing some background uh, research on how you put the movie together and all the trips you took and you went to Ford and all these different aspects that added up to the authenticity of the film. Are these kind of activities or trips, you know, you took a road trip on Route 66, do all production houses do something like this for a film like Cars that's an animated film or was that part of the level of detail that Pixar is at? I think Pixar is always really going back to that word authenticity again, always making sure that's authentic in what it's presenting. And, you know, you guys know you've watched plenty of films where they don't get the details right. right. They didn't yeah. hire a car consultant. Right. You're like, dude, why is there a 1974 yes. Super Beetle in a 50s movie? It's like the whole thing's fake. Even I'm, I'm just going to just throw this out there. Brad Bird, who directed Iron Giant, which is, you know, an awesome animated film. He also directed Incredibles for us. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic director. When you watch Iron Giant, which he made before he came to Pixar, um, the little boy Hogarth is in this junkyard and the giant robot picks him up and puts him in a 59 Cadillac and they're swinging around and the movie's set in 1957. I go, man, that's amazing. You could get a 59 yeah. Cadillac <laughs> in a junkyard. It was garbage yeah. in 1957. Oh, How'd they do that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think we do that research for every film. We really do. Cars was, here's why Cars was unique. Most of our films, if it's about uh, toys or fish or robots or monsters, you create the world yes. for the most part, right? Cars is a world where we created in-house vehicles like Lightning McQueen or Mater. Those were our designs. Bob Polly again, designed these characters from scratch based on a lot of different things. But we also had real cars, right? Mm-hmm. Like Sheriff is a 49 Merc and Sarge is a 42 Willys Jeep and, you know, Fillmore is a 60 bus. So that was the first time we really had these main characters, main on-screen characters that were licensed vehicles. So we had to go to those manufacturers and say, hey, can we use X vehicle for this film? And that I was That's part incredible. of that process too, that pitching to all these car companies. Yeah. So going off of, you know, those those famous characters in the in the film like Doc Hudson, how how did you guys approach like a Paul Newman or a George Carlin? How did how did you pull such heavy, you know, not all not only auto enthusiasts, but George Carlin, Jay Leno, you got a, a yeah. ton of cameos. Michael in Schumacher at Michael the Schumacher. end. Michael Schumacher, yeah. Michael Schumacher at the end, yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, Disney does have a lot of great connections for, for character voices, and we have a casting department that will go to people and, and put those things out to them. Sometimes people turn it down, you know, and, and that has happened before. Hmm. Um, luckily, Paul Newman, I think, for Doc Hudson was possibly one of the most perfect casting decisions ever because he actually was a racer. Mm-hmm. And when we gave him the script and the lines for the movie, he was like, 
that's not right. That's not what a car would do. You know, <laughs> and so, you know, John being the director was like, well, what would you say here? Well, what would the car do here? And he's like, well, first of all, you know, if McQueen, this is a Paul Newman thing. Do you remember the end of the first race? McQueen gets in the back of Mac after he deals with the sponsors and he's going cross country, right? Mm -hmm. To go to this tiebreaker race in California. And he falls out and ends up in Raider Springs. And Paul Newman's like, you try to put a race car with slicks on the street. He's just going to be like spinning all over the place. And he, he can't do anything on slicks. He's got to have treaded tires. And so if you watch at the end of the race, McQueen goes up to Mac. He pops off his slicks and he puts on these yeah, like treaded, treaded tires. groove tires. That's yeah. such a weird esoteric detail. But Paul was like, that's, you know, you got to do it. So it made sense for McQueen to have those treaded tires until we go to the final race of the movie. Super nerdy stuff we yeah. did because we just Going lavished those details. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, what, I, what I really love about it is all of the Easter eggs and some of the stuff that you've mentioned, even that when um, he's pulling the uh, the tar machine and he's refinishing the road. Yeah. And then he's like, yep, it's done. And then Mater <laughs> goes on and he's bouncing <laughs> up and down. I mean, even the, the cafe, the Flows V8 cafe, and you have the um, spark plugs on the top. The flathead Ford. Yeah. yeah pe people yes. wouldn't necessarily notice <laughs> that if they weren't a car person. But there's so many That's little right. details that really fit the, the um, it, it makes the car person happy when they see it. You're saying that the, the, the details make the automotive enthusiast feel recognized that yeah. we got the details go. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. recognition. Um, and that somebody cares about us on the other end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the yeah. yeah. Somebody, somebody sees you as car people. Um, you know, the funny thing about all those details were we, we really wanted to get those right. We cared about getting those right. And the other thing I think that's more important is the connection that people had with cars that they didn't have before. And I'll give you an example. After the movie came out, I went to the Peterson Automotive Museum and we did a presentation on the art of Pixar, how we did all the art for the mm -hmm. film. And this guy comes up to me. He literally has tears in his eyes. And he said, I've seen the film like hundreds of times. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And he said, um, I have, he goes, I have to thank you for making the movie. I'm like, yeah, thank you. You know, th I appreciate it. And he said, you don't understand. He said, I have a Hudson Hornet. I've always had a Hudson Hornet. And my grandkids would come over and they didn't give a crap about that car. They just didn't care. They wanted to play video games, play outside. They never talked to me about that car. And he said, that movie came out and the kids realized I had a, a Doc Hudson in my garage. Yeah. He said, every weekend we go for a ride in the car. So it created a relationship with his grandkids that he didn't have before that movie. And it was literally like this emotional moment, you know, of like, yeah. wow, that movie caused people to come together. That's what you could only dream of making a film is that you make an emotional connection with your viewers. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what that did. Story. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things we talk about on the podcast and at the museum all the time is that cars for a lot of people are just a tool of life. But for us and for many, it's so much more than that. And you look at the greater culture and there's so many people deeply involved with cars. Um, can you believe that this movie has added that much to it? Like just like the Fast and the Furious, it's just <laughs> completely <laughs> taken a generation of people and gotten them hooked. Yeah, I, I, we, we are fortunate to live in this time that we can make content that's so good because when you look at what we had for movies and television in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I mean, we, we had Knight Rider and we had A-Team. We had these other things that, that got you a little excited, but they weren't as deep and immersive. They were sort of little flashes in the pan. But like you said, when you look at cars now or you look at Fast and Furious, there's theme parks and games and publishing and like it, it goes so deep now, right? This love of this thing goes so deep with people that, like you said, the, the girl in your office that doesn't know about real cars, but she loves Cars the movie. Um, if you guys ever get a chance to go to Disneyland in California and you go to Cars Land, we built this immersive environment that literally feels like you're in Radiator Springs. We spent five years on it and it's got a full size downtown Radiator Springs. Wow, so those V8 cool. lights up exactly like the movie. Mm. Every business is on the main street. Um, the, the, the traffic light, every third <laughs> blink is slower on the traffic light <laughs> like in the movie. And um, it was like the love of my life because it was five years of building this literally bringing a movie to life, which you just, you don't get to do that. And, um, I went to the Hershey swap meet for mm -hmm. three or four years in a row and just bought tons and tons of old parts. And we dressed them oh, up in the great. queue areas. It was amazing. Were you involved, uh, with the Crocs and, uh, cars <laughs> collaboration? 
Indeed, indeed. In fact, I have a pair of those original Crocs. So if you don't know how that started for those who are listening in, um, you know, Crocs is this ubiquitous slipper that everybody loves. And there was an adult, we, we made kids, kids McQueen Crocs. We made them forever and they were big sellers. And there's even a wheelie version, yep. you know, where you can roll. Right. And this adult man who probably I'm guessing lived in his mom's basement um, started this kind of GoFundMe or Kickstarter campaign. And he basically said, hey, Crocs, I want you guys to make adult McQueen Crocs and he basically had this uh, sheet of people that signed up that said I agree with this guy you should make adult light McQueen Crocs and he got like 150,000 <laughs> signatures I don't know how I, I don't know why you know, this guy had a lot of time on his hands Dedicated. and so Crocs was like yeah so Crocs was like oh okay you're saying adult lightning mcqueen crocs uh, <laughs> uh, all right we're gonna do a run of um i think it was forty thousand. like we're gonna do forty thousand pairs and we're probably gonna lose our butt on them they sold out in like uh a couple of hours completely sold out in a number of hours they were on mm. ebay for six to eight hundred dollars for a pair mm. yeah so they just announced back in september for lightning mcqueen day nine five is mcqueen day we did an they did another run of ninety thousand pairs and they sold out again mm. so you know, it is now generational. There are now adults that grew up with cars that like still love the movie. Danny Suarez, the F1 driver, was telling me when he was a kid, he had a Light McQueen poster on his room. That's what made him want to become a NASCAR driver. Incredible. That's insane. See that? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's like... a real crazy impact. Well, Sam here behind the camera is actually wearing a pair of those Crocs right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, do you, when you step yeah, down, can you, up. yours light up? Will they light up? Oh, they light up. He showed us to it. Good. He doesn't wear them outside. Well, Jay, we kept bumping into him because he didn't have his blinkers on. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, McQueen doesn't have turn signals. He's a race car, man. I wore mine to Pebble Beach Concord, and somebody dared me 25 bucks to wear them out on the lawn. I was like, I don't want to get kicked out of Pebble Beach. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I posed with them. And suddenly you were the most class there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was great. I love it. I love it. How many other cars trinkets are there i mean it, it must be endless huh oh, ton of toys it it is endless of course die cast i mean yep. you know um mattel has made thousands and thousands and thousands of oh, these little die cast i've been to the factory and watched them being made and i actually got to like do the labels myself oh, and package cool. one up and it it's it's phenomenal and you just realize like we're all still little kids right we still like to play with cars uh either big or small but we love the, these things so much things that have wheels that's fantastic so. what's one of the weirder trinkets i like what what is the weirdest trinket you've come across on the first cars they were kind of fast and loose on the licensing and they made a um a kid's dvd player that had a built-in television and it was mcqueen's face so it was like the eyes were the windscreen and you loaded that scary chest tape in and it was so creepy it was so wrong yeah uh and that's you know somehow that got through we we get a little tighter as time goes on we're like sure. no nah, we're not gonna let you do that but yeah we we've made some we've made some oddball stuff over time for sure oh my gosh well yeah in the last podcast we talked about uh the nascar race that was happening in los angeles and i know that the, the la coliseum yeah, yeah the la coliseum i was there yeah in the in the original um race in the opening scene i've seen an interview where you mentioned that that stadium was based off of the la coliseum so how does it feel to see a real nascar race there yeah so so actually the the final race of cars was was final the la race, coliseum yeah the final race no exactly and um it is crazy that it kind of comes full circle and that's why we brought the lightning mcqueen to the race last year we brought a full-size mcqueen and put it in the fan zone yeah. um, and we brought it back again this year and we last year we actually brought mcqueen out on the track and positioned it on the track and i sent out a tweet to nascar and i said well, we thought of it first, but I'm glad you guys finally got here. And NASCAR responded back to that. And they're like, ka -chow, or something like that. And I was like, that's super cool. It, it blows my mind, right? That like things in the movie have become reality. That's, that's incredible to think about. That something we did is like carifying this world and the world has brought cars into it. Um, so many amazing things have happened to me in my life personally just because of that film i mean getting to work on that sally special um you know meeting all my heroes of racing honestly i met got to meet everybody from you know dan gurney before he passed to carol shelby to you know jay leno like you guys interviewed and all these people that were part of the world of cars it's opened so many doors for me in the automotive space that i you know i can't even begin to thank everybody enough for what it's allowed me to do that's so amazing even to this day you know it's almost 15 years or so um that you're still having these experiences where you're 
your mind is being blown. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it does still happen. It's, it's really crazy. And the love that people have for that movie and for Pixar around the world is, is incredible to me that we're still, you know, producing these films that people just totally love and cherish. Everybody kind of has their favorite, whether it's Toy Story or Nemo or, you know, WALL-E or Up or whatever. And it's, it's awesome that we get to bring these things to life. One thing that I really enjoy about the Pixar films is the sound design and how you guys recorded real NASCAR sounds and real race car sounds for those race scenes. There's so many movies, and this was kind of what you guys were talking about before with the 59 Caddy, but there's so many scenes where you'll have a car chase or a motorcycle chase, and it's not the right sound, and it totally ruins it for me. And you guys did such a fantastic job of capturing real life sounds. Yeah, um, that was a that was a big thing for us. We made the list of vehicles and we got those vehicles to come to the studio and recorded them in the parking lot when we could, or we would go to them. And um, even the sounds of doors closing on things, you know, yeah. we don't open and close doors in the cars too much. Um, but making sure that all that was 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 dead on because it all works, right? It's all telling the story. If it's all done well, it just puts you deeper in the world and it it sort of belies the fact you're watching a film about animated cars. I remember even myself watching uh the scene in cars when mcqueen promises mater i'll give you a ride in a helicopter someday but he you know he doesn't really mean it he's kind of being a show off and he goes back to his cozy cone and sally's talking to him she's like are you sure you meant that because like mater looks up to you do you remember that and in that moment sally backs up to pull away from mcqueen and the backup lights go on in the correct place on a 996 yeah. and i was like what like it's cr the sound is a sound of a 996 backing up with the gear whine that that car makes is it's obvious we recorded the real car and you're like Man, I love that. I love that we did that. Yeah. It holds up, you know. Um, so I, I've, I'm a serial like like many of us uh, who love cars. Um, I, I'm a collector. I like collecting things, and um, I collect albums, cars, not so much just because you know I have a family, so the priority right now. But um, they take up a lot of space too. I found. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> they take up a lot of space. That, you know, that like is families, true. Yeah. yeah, families or cars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But when you I give was, her the I, family, you got room for a lot more cars. Yeah. So I was doing a little, yeah. you know, research on cars, and I read that Cars was the last Pixar film to be released on VHS. Oh. And I, it was very I rare, that. apparently. So oh. what what I wanted to do, what I what I was doing, I was like, I'm gonna go online and see what these copies are. I just was curious because. Um, <laughs> Things like Nintendo 64 games and their original boxes are now exploding in value. So huh. I went online and I found an original Cars. I don't know if you can see this. It's a it's a Cars VHS in its okay. original wrapping that's okay. been rated. So someone sent it in to be authenticated to make sure that it's in its original wrapping. The corners are okay. all great. And okay. um, it's for sale. So I wanted to see if you had an idea what somebody would be selling an original cars vhs for that's been rated a uh, high rating in its original wrapping is i know it's unopened, it's unopened. So it's a, unopened it's a, it's a, yeah it's a new old stock new old yep. stock NOS. unopened NOS. verified <laughs> original cars vhs i'm i'm gonna go i'm gonna go 50 bucks 50 bucks 50 bucks that's lower than i expected you to guess well, I, I'm, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the market of, of the love of VHS. I mean, I feel like we made a gazillion Cars VHSs. It may have been the last film released on it, but it was extremely popular on VHS. So I feel like there's got to be a bunch of copies around. I don't know. Maybe I'll bump it up. We'll say 100, 150 bucks. So it's currently listed for $35,000. Okay, the guy's hot. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> So that's, you know, there was an unopened Nintendo 64 that recently sold for two hundred thousand dollars. I so, don't know. I I probably got some sealed copies of Cars on VHS somewhere at work. I need to start. Digging so around. if you so have any sealed, I just wanted to let you know. If you have any sealed copies of Cars, yeah, yeah, send it in to get verified because they are uh, they are starting to explode. It seems. I'm thinking the Audrain auction this year. This could be the big fundraiser, right? Forget about trips oh, to that's Europe. that's a great you, idea. That is a good the idea. The Cars VHS tape could be the big the big seller at the auction. Well, you just said the guy was on drugs, so you got to kind of pick a side here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm changing. I'm changing my All position. Right. I'm changing my position. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a really quick story about cars and merchandise. So I did a car show at Pixar for many years called the Motorama. And it started as an employee vehicle show in our in our 
and basically on our grounds. And I had employees who, who had vintage cars put them on display for the day because we all had old cars, but we never organized it. So we had a Pixar car show, called it the Motorama. I had a band play. We had barbecue food. There's a really high-end European um, car broker across the street called Fantasy Junction. And Fantasy Junction brought two beautiful cars, and I put them out front. And the show grew every year. It started in 01, 02, 03. And then we started working on the movie cars. So I started having relationships with manufacturers. And I'd say, hey, Ford, do you, could you bring the Ford 49 concept out? And they're like, okay. You know, hey, GM, can we have a real Motorama show car? Okay. So the show just kept getting better and better. It was for employees only. It was not open to the public. If Joe Blow even pulled up in his Camaro, we're like, you can't put your car in. This is an employee car show with VIP guests. And it became a massive, huge thing. For the 10th anniversary of the Motorama, I took a Lightning McQueen and made a special die cast for employees only. It had the number 10 on the hood. You can type in Motorama McQueen. You can yeah. find one online to this day. And they, when that movie came out, they were selling, or sorry, when the, when that, when we had the Motorama that year, that car was selling online for six to $800 for one of those die casts. I think they're down to about 250 now, but I mean, it was one of those things where people want to have those little rare, you know, Pixar tidbits. So pretty That's interesting. So crazy. I love that though. Yeah. I think Sam has like 10 pairs of Crocs in his uh, closet <laughs> waiting for them to Yeah, he's our, he's our resident diehard Cars fan. Yeah, so. Sam is a Only mega one so fan. Far. <laughs> so do, Sam is aware that the Light McQueen Crocs have both a street and a race mode. Does he know that, that there's two modes in the Crocs? Yes. So street mode is strap forward. <laughs> if you put the strap back, that's race mode. Once it goes around the heel, then you're ready to totally Wait, Sam, what do you racing. have them in right now? Uh, yeah, are you race or back street mode? currently. So you're in race oh, mode. he's in race mode. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, better aerodynamics. Do you, does Sam feel we should make a pair of Mater Crocs? That's the question. Would those would those he be, would a good be the seller? first one to buy them? Oh yes, I would be the yeah. first to buy it. That's a good point. Like, what happens when your Lady McQueen Crocs collapse or fall apart? I'm trying not to you think about that You need the Mater ones to kind of save them. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Sally Carrera. Uh, Sam yeah. will only wear Francisco them indoors. <laughs> yeah. Before we say bye to Sam, uh, but Jay, do you have any questions for Jay Sam as a diehard enthusiast? I, you can ask me any cars question. Steve, you have one? What, what about what we were talking about earlier with uh, Francesco? What sound did you yes. use to ah, uh, good question. for Francesco? What engine? Oh, wow. Good question. I mean, we, for Francesco's sounds, you know, we didn't have access to a Formula One car here in the U.S. when we made the movie. So I'm guessing we must have recorded some stuff over in Europe for that. I, that is a great question. I will have to get back to you with the answer on that one. Ooh, we stumped him. He wow. stumped me on that. I do not know what we use for Francesco's recordings. I remember when we were designing him, and it was pre-Halo. It's 4F1 cars had halos. Um, we were trying to figure out where to put the eyes and all that. And Jay Schuster was the designer of that car. He's the same guy who designed Wally the robot. He designed that helmet shape that sits inside the cockpit and the eyes are inside that little helmet shape in the cockpit of Francesco, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. And I love that character. Um, you know, open wheel racing was bigger in Europe at the time than it was in the U S and now since drive to survive and the popularity of F1, like Francesco, I think it's a good, good time to be, uh, thinking about that guy again, <laughs> bringing him back, man. He's a great car. He's the man. <laughs> yeah. John Turturro voiced him. Well, I think that's a good place to end today. Jay, thank you so much for coming on the show. We thank really you, appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was great. I think you made Sam's day. <laughs> <laughs> Slash life. <laughs> I'm always I'm always happy to talk about real cars and of course yeah. the world of cars. So anytime you want me back, I'm here for you. And also thank you for being one of the biggest Audrain supporters and always coming out and helping wherever you can. So we really, really appreciate that. No, I, I love the Audrain. I love what you guys have done. I love the enthusiasm, the fact that you guys consider the younger generation coming up with the 30 under 30 class, which I, I've been lucky enough to judge a few times. Um, it's just fantastic. And you guys have grown it into an amazing, not just an event, but it's really an all encompassing cultural thing you've created in Newport, Rhode Island. You would just never think about that there, you know, and Nick Shorsh and that whole team just willed that whole thing into existence by just sheer love of the automobile and the resources to do it, which they can tell you it's not easy to start a Concours. It's not cheap to start a Concours. And they did a fantastic job to start from zero to that. Um, they knocked it out of the park. Um, yeah, and I'll always be there to support you guys as long as I can. I hope it, hope I can uh, continue just to do that forever. I, I love being part of it. One of my favorite things is drawing 
a McQueen sketch and a Mater sketch for the auction. And I always do it there at the Viking Hotel before the event. I don't draw it ahead of time. The, the part is it was made in Newport, Rhode That's Island awesome. and auctioned so cool. off there. So I do that every time. we got to get That's lightning blast. here. <laughs> yeah, we need to get the life size lighting years. there. Sam yes. wants Sally to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the guy who owns the Sally special is a super fantastic guy. He's very easygoing. I think it'd be honestly it'd be phenomenal to have that car here. I mean, at the, at the, the we yeah, have to call Newport him. one year. Yeah, we can, right. we can make that happen. Thank you, Jay. As always, like, subscribe, comment, share. We'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.